In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. From time to time, we've been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. I'm here to talk to you about the problem of slavery. It didn't end in the 1860s. It's a social malady that's with us today, and it's increasing in its scope and virulence. The desire to enslave our fellow man is unfortunately intrinsic to the human character. It has been with us since the beginning of time on every continent and in virtually every culture. From ancient Egypt to Babylon to Greece and Rome, Africa, Asia, Europe and the United States. Germany and Japan openly practiced widespread slavery only 50 years ago. And the Soviet Union until less than a decade ago. China even today. It's a disease of our human nature and yet people are under the impression that it no longer exists. I say to you that in a subtle form, it exists in America today, and it's becoming less subtle and more manifest. Madison Avenue has just cleaned it up a little bit, dressed it up in new words. The slave master is now a big brother, someone to protect you, someone to confide in. But it's all the same. He owns your life. Now, this may sound far-fetched, but I think I can prove it. When the IRS allows you a tax deduction, they and their congressional collaborators and the media call it a tax subsidy. In other words, they designate it as a gift to you, a subsidy. The only way they could conceive this terminology is by presupposing that they, i.e. the government, own all the money. Their view is that they're entitled to it all, that which they allow you to keep is their compassionate and generous gift to you. How can this be? You create the money by your efforts, your sacrifice, your creativity, your risk-taking. So how can it belong to them? It's very simple. They own you. They own everything you produce, your money, your house, your thoughts and ideas, your children. If you go to a foreign country to work, you still have to pay the U.S. income tax. You could dig a hole in the middle of Siberia and they'd be entitled to a cut of your wages because in their minds, under their law, they own you. They create arcane and esoteric laws to criminalize you. You may try, but you can't obey them. You can't even understand them without a lot of professional help. You have to run around slavishly collecting little pieces of paper, receipts, seven years of detailed financial records because you might be called on to give an account of yourself to the big boss man. And if you've made a mistake, he can take everything you have. He loves it that way. That Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? that you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. What is the Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world, built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. People are so caught up in this, this race stuff and they worry about black and white that they forgetting that white people are in slavery too. <laughs> All of us Americans are in slavery. If you have a lease or you have to pay your rent or you have to pay your loan, if you got to pay anybody else, you are in slavery. If you do your work and you go to work, and you come from work and you have to pay somebody else, you're in slavery. Like you are enslaved to your credit, your rent, your bills, your DPNL, your water. You in slavery to all that stuff. Are you able to get rid of it? Or do you have to pay it? Once you get older and you become an adult, once you're not once you're not a kid anymore. You are a slave unless you are rich. 
Now there's there's ways that you can play and you can be on a better side, but for most of the Americans who work a regular nine to five or eight to five, whatever hours you work, if you have to go to work for 40 hours a week and you're doing something that you really truly do not want to do and you have to pay somebody to live your life, to live a basic decent lifestyle that any American, any person in this world is entitled to, then you are a slave. And it, and you see the, the white people go to work, black people go to work, Mexicans go to work, Chinese people go to work on a daily basis. The daily basis, you have to go to work for another person. So you are in slavery. So don't be worried about who hates you. Worry about doing you. Worry about doing your own business, taking care of what you got to take care of. Just because somebody else out there and they're getting harassed and stuff like that. Yeah, you fight against it. You fight against it. But don't don't think that it's just us. It's not just the black people. It's the world. The world is going through this shit. Hi everybody and thank you for viewing this video. My name is Isabel and today what I'd like to go through is the idea and concept of freedom. Now, a few days ago I was driving against the traffic and I was looking at the opposite side of the road and looking at all those cars heading towards the city to go to work at something like uh, 7.30 in the morning. Anyway, so as I was driving along, I noticed how they were going really slowly and it seemed like they were almost chained together, these people. You know, they were all heading in the same direction really slowly and really automatically like robots. It kind of resembled to me a sense of slavery. If you contrast that to ancient slavery and if you look at, you know, how the slaves were tied together with rope or with chains and were whipped by Romans and things like that, you kind of realize that our modern day society isn't too far off from that. Um, although we don't get the direct abuse, obviously we don't get the whipping and things like that. Um, we do, in a sense, we, we kind of think that we do have freedom in the sense that we can, you know, switch on our iPod or, you know, put on the music in our radio or listen to the breakfast show or something like that. Um, in that aspect, we believe that we actually have a sense of freedom um, and that we're in like modern day vehicles and things like that. We're kind of in the same way chained together and heading towards the same direction, you know, because we have work to do. Now, um, if we decide not to take that path, then we won't have money. And if we don't have money, we won't be able to survive in this society. We won't be able to buy food. We won't be able to do this and that. We won't have the luxury of life. So it's not really an option to quit work and just sit there and, you know, get payment from the government or something, because that's not very, um, it's not a very efficient way of living. Um, now, my point is that um, if you kind of take a distance from this, if you kind of step backwards and you have a look at why we work in the first place, very few people can come up with very good reasons why we actually work. I mean, what is this human obsession with keeping busy all the time or with kind of like doing something? What is this human obsession with not being able to just live a life in, in, in sort of nature, you know, not having to build all of this stuff? Because if we didn't have to build all of these hotels, all of these roads, all of these cars, all of these things, then, then we wouldn't have to work in the first place. And why is it that we need to do that kind of stuff? Why is it that we actually need, you know, to keep on getting better and better, you know, keep on improving technology, keep on doing this and that? What's the point? I mean, what is the point? You're only here for about a hundred years, if you're lucky. You're only here for a limited time period. And unfortunately, the moment you're born into this society, you're sort of brainwashed in order to, you know, you need to take the following steps. You need to, you know, first you get born, then you go to kindergarten, then you go to school, you spend 12 years at school, then you go to hopefully university, then you go to work. By then you're brainwashed. 
by then you're integrated into the society you're doing exactly what the society expects you to do to live as a citizen of the society and to be a slave to the workforce to devote your entire life to devote your entire time your time away from your family so that you can be out there to help people construct bigger bigger and bigger buildings bigger and bigger bridges and better technology but why what for i mean what is there to really achieve there's nothing to really achieve out there it's it's actually work in a sense is diminishing our our, our living conditions it's diminishing people's ability to spend time with their families which is what is more important it's diminishing the quality of relationships if you look at the divorce rate most of that is because there's money issues or there's problems with you know couples not spending enough time together etc it's not directly due to the fact that human beings are bad it's due to the fact that this society expects us to sacrifice our entire lives our entire lives from age zero maybe age three up to age 65 to do stuff for the society i mean if you think about it whoever really wants to do that isn't there more to this life than just to work and just to travel in the morning to, you know, to and fro with the traffic? I mean, there has to be something more. There has to be greater meaning because a person gets up to 65 and then they realize, what was that for? Like after 65 years, they realize that was a waste of time. And now I have my freedom, but now I don't know what to do with it because I need to be busy in order to, you know, have a normal functioning mind. You know, they can't, they lose a sense of uh, self because they're so consumed with, you know, traveling to work or working for a particular company. They get so obsessed about, you know, following the exact criteria that, you know, people around them are following, you know, to first, you know, go to school, then go to work. It's kind of like sheep, you know, blind sheep. One sheep's going that way, the other one's following because they don't know what they're doing. So they're just using that as a model. But you really need to question whether all of this is actually worth it, whether it's actually worth your entire life to sacrifice to a particular company or to particular work, uh, to a particular work type. Now to an extraordinary look inside the world of Apple, the company that makes those gadgets that millions of us love. We're most interested in the people who build their complex gadgets one tiny piece at a time. As a whole, it's an incredibly complex process, but look at the individuals and you see mostly teenagers from the countryside, 17, 18 year olds far away from very poor homes. So this is home. They live in a dorm with seven strangers, spend six days a week repeating the same task again and again. Fatigue and boredom are common in any factory, but this one is surrounded by suicide nets. They are everywhere. A horrifying reminder of 18 workers who jumped from the buildings here at Foxconn City in the past few years. The suicide rate in this massive company is lower than average in China. But after people jumped in such a sobering cluster, Foxconn opened a counseling center and raised starting wages about 25 cents an hour. I wonder though... Words. The slave master is now a big brother, someone to protect you, someone to confide in. But it's all the same. He owns your life. This may sound far-fetched. The United States of America, home to 300 million people. Each of us assuming that if we obey the law and mind our own business, there's no reason for anyone to pay much attention to us. That's what we might think, but we would be wrong. Records are being created of activities that used to be wholly private. There are a lot of companies that you've never heard about, but they heard something about you. Detailed personal information is being collected every day and used in ways we could never imagine. Most Americans are in your database somewhere, right? Also billions of transactions. Internet searches are being recorded. They keep everything. Your political leanings, your religious leanings, your medical concerns, your sexual concerns. Driving habits are being monitored. Vehicle speed, engine speed, whether the brakes are on or off. Employees are surveilled. He's heading back to the shop right now. Shoppers are observed, recorded, and analyzed. That's an alert right there. 
and personal phone calls? I was under the impression that nobody could steal my cell phone records. As it turns out, I was very, very wrong. We are living through a revolution, a surveillance revolution empowered by technology. Literally within five to seven minutes, we've identified the individual. It's technology that can be put to good use to stop terrorists and solve crimes. But if information falls into the wrong hands, or it's just plain wrong, it can ruin lives. I went without a job for months. Tough four months? Very, very difficult for me. From implantable chips. They make a small incision in your arm. To data mining companies. Well, how secure is that database? We take an unprecedented look at the powerful business of personal information. We're not mining through the personal lives of innocent Americans. The government is now working with big business to take surveillance and information gathering to levels that were once the stuff of science fiction. Big Brother, if allowed to happen, will happen. And our job as responsible human beings in society is to make sure that that does not occur. Dr. Amanda Reeve, a Fresno, California OBGYN, had never heard of Choice Point. But Choice Point had heard of her. It's Choice Point's business to know about you. The company maintains a database that has information on virtually every U.S. citizen. It's trove of personal data, an estimated 17 billion records includes phone numbers, addresses, credit reports, property records, bank accounts, insurance policies, and social security numbers. It sells this information to major corporations, nonprofit organizations, and the government. Choice Point's detailed information is used by its clients to conduct employee background checks, direct marketing, and criminal investigations. It's also valuable to thieves intent on stealing our identity. Dr. Reeve didn't know any of that on the day she first heard the name on the radio. Economic data out today showed double the I heard a short piece of the news, you know, something about this place called Choice Point. They had some sort of a breach of information. People's uh, identities had been stolen. In 2005, the Alpharetta, Georgia company discovered it had given accounts and therefore access to its database to identity thieves posing as legitimate businesses. Reeve found out she was at risk when she received this letter. The letter talked about how my information may have been given out accidentally and some people might have taken that information and they could apply for credit. Maybe I should call this number. The aftermath continues. I cannot apply for credit. I don't give information on the phone. It's nerve-wracking because that information is out there and I don't have any control over which way it goes, how it gets used. 